my uh, last time in this seminar was three or four years ago for uh, a speech about net neutrality. And uh, of course, we'll refer at the moment to net neutrality, which is an important uh, piece of the puzzle in order to, to get uh, a cool digital world and not only a smart digital world. Um, so, uh, as you mentioned, uh, my main job now is not an academic job. I'm in char um, one of the members of the Council of, for the Regulation uh, of Audiovisual Sector, which is a full-time job, <laughs> I may say so. And, um, but at my free uh, moments uh, during the weekends and during the nights, I'm still thinking <laughs> about the digital world. And it's impossible not to think about the digital world because we are completely uh, uh, surrounded by by it. In a way, uh, philosophers say that it's not a technological uh, tool uh, as uh, was the train or the plane or the car, the, all these objects of the industrial revolution. The objects of a digital world are global objects. They are both tools in our hands, but they are also um, the way we think, the way we, we communicate, uh, the way uh, we exchange, and the way we uh, fulfill all those cognitive functions which are uh, essential from the start of humanity, which are uh, very essential to uh, human life. So in this way, digital world, digital revolution is more something like uh, the invention of uh, writing or the invention of printing than uh, the invention of uh, the steam engine. Well, um, I don't know exactly about the schedule, uh, so I should speak about 45 minutes, is that right? And Seven then, minutes. then you, you will go for next 15 minutes and we'll, we'll have a global discussion afterwards. So I've prepared maybe too much material, but we will skip some, some of it or we'll go rapidly on some of the slides. What, what about the digital revolution? I think that the main uh, thing that you must have in mind when you think of uh, digital is <coughs> the so-called liberation of information. Liberation, now you are economists, you know what a good or a service is. Now information uh, has become a good by itself. It's not necessarily consumed on a material support. Before you consumed a physical book, uh, physical uh, CD or DVD, now you can consume information which is dematerialized on, on, on the networks, which has, of course, important economic consequences. It's not so much the topic of today, but the main consequence is the zero marginal cost, the so-called mar zero marginal cost economy, where it costs nothing or almost nothing to replicate digital information. So when I get it's a public good, in the uh, theoretical meaning of the, the term, uh, the fact that I consume information, that I consume a file of music or a file of a movie or a file of a novel, uh, doesn't prevent others to uh, consume it uh, at the same time. And uh, the cost, the, f the <coughs> technical cost of transmitting the information, storing it in the network, transmitting it, is uh, uh, peanuts, uh, but the global cost, of course, is not zero because there is a huge fix fixed cost, a double fixed cost. The fixed cost of uh, building up the infrastructure, the network, mobile and fixed uh, networks. Fiber, you, you know that uh, in France we have a, a big uh, governmental plan for uh, um, uh, for building a fiber uh, network. Uh, uh, down to the home, and this costs several uh, billions, of course, of, um, of euros, uh, which is a huge fixed cost, but once this fixed cost has been paid, then if the capacity is enough, you can uh, throw in the network any bitrate you, you like without uh, congestion, and uh, 
out of congestion, there is a practically no cost. So liberation of information is important from that point of view. It's completely change the rules of economy. We enter an economy of fixed cost, and which, mean, uh, which doesn't mean that uh, cultural or informational goods should be delivered for free, but uh, the pricing should rather uh, be based on uh, subscription, on uh, lump, lump sum payments, rather than payments per unity. And another aspect is that uh, no, as uh, liberation is no more uh, completely tied to atoms <laughs> and uh, no more uh, completely tied to energy, it may, it's free to help matter, atoms, and energy, kilowatts, to be more clever. Today, in your car, you buy a car, even a medium-sized uh, car, uh, the electronic part of it, the digital part of it, is a small part of the cost, but it's uh, <coughs> completely pervasive in the usage of your car. It, uh, it rules the, <coughs> the engine, uh, it rules the, um, <coughs> your uh, board uh, computer, it, uh, it rules uh, uh, even the comfort and uh, the, the tunings of the different uh, parameters that you may adjust to, be, to live better within your car. All that is completely commanded, um, monitored by, by uh, digital systems. And uh, the car is connected to the road. Soon, uh, you, you know, of course, about Google cars, autonomous cars, but also the, the road itself will become clever in a way with uh, sensors, uh, captors uh, within the, on, on the road itself or in the, the in, in the very texture of the road, you may have uh, captors which uh, will signal you uh, where uh, there is a hole and you, you must, uh, you must, or your car <laughs> must slow down in order not to, uh, to have a too much uh, important hit. So, all that uh, is maybe a, a little like what I said to you uh, the very introduction of my speech is that information is completely pervasive and uh, is uh, not only uh, a tool but um, a way of life. Um, it's like the air of uh, the air for the <coughs> for the birds or the, <laughs> the ocean for the fish. It's the environment itself, which is completely uh, filled up with uh, information and digital systems. So what I, um, what I call for is that I would call an ecology of the digital space. So we live in a digital space uh, and ecology of the digital place means how to live well together in a digital environment. And uh, I discussed with two of you, with the two of you, uh, before the others uh, came. And um, I, I told them that in, in the cab this morning, I heard on the radio that today and the next two days are the days of deconnection. So we are all supposed not to open or not to open uh, too often during these three days our digital uh, tools. And it's a, maybe an excessive reaction, but it's a reaction to the fact that uh, if we don't care, our digital life may be uh, stressing, uh, may even cause uh, psychic disease, uh, be, uh, uh, create addiction real addiction as drug addiction. And if you don't want this uh, big brother world where the system watches on, on us, so we have a stress of uh, being examined, of being tracked at any moment by search engines, by uh, uh, Google, by uh, we, are, we are addressed fake news from, uh, from the dark side of the net on the one hand, and uh, on the other hand, uh, we became completely addict to that. So uh, 
we are both victims, uh, we are consenting victims. If we don't wa want of that world where the digital harms us instead of uh, benefiting us, we have to care in three uh, main domains, our social life, our economic life, and uh, also our the quality of our environment is in the uh, ordinary sense of uh, the term uh, in, in, both, in, in both ways. In a way, uh, non-controlled growth of digital systems, data where huge data warehouses, huge computer centers consume a lot of energy. So this is no good for uh, energy uh, saving, this is no good for uh, the ozone, <laughs> um, <coughs> for the gas effet de serre, you know, the gas uh, which uh, make holes in the, in the atmosphere. Global warming? Yeah. Huh? Global warming. Oui. Global warming, but there is a name for... Huh? Amy, huh? Yes. Emissions. Uh, so, ITs, in, information technology, uh, <coughs> may are, are not necessarily good for environment. That's one way. And uh, the other way, they may be, they may be very good uh, to help environment policy, to give information about the geosphere, to uh, to control uh, warming, to control emissions, to control. Uh, energy. So it's, there is an ambivalent in all for society, I just mentioned it with the, the, our, the quality of our digital life, of our uh, uh, sociability, uh, of our uh, welfare in the uh, um, daily uh, activities. And from economic side, I, I just uh, gave an example with a zero marginal cost uh, law. Uh, we have of also to adapt because of the cultural industry, uh, um, the book industry, the movie industry, the music industry have to uh, strongly adapt to this new deal where they cannot collect value and make money as we did before because the business plans are not, uh, not at all the, the same. So that I also mentioned rapidly at the beginning. Um, digital revolution is a double revolution. It's as, as a technological tool, uh, digital networks and devices are something like uh, cars, planes, uh, or, or before uh, a steam engine. So they are, this is an industrial revolution which produces new kinds of uh, objects, which are tools. This is the classical view. Uh, it's a third industrial revolution, the first one at the end of the 18th century around steam engine, the second one at the end of uh, uh, the 19th with uh, uh, petrol, electricity, and thus cars and, and planes. And the third one uh, at the uh, end of uh, the 20th century, and we are now uh, uh, completely uh, inside, which is, uh, the, from the industrial point of view, the, um, uh, the technology of uh, software and uh, hardware, electronics, microelectronics. But the other important aspect is, of course, the cognitive aspect, as those tools are not only tools, but they are uh, an environments, ways of life. And from that point of view, as I said, uh, if you look at the sequence, I told, you, I told you about writing, printing, and web. I distinguish uh, web from internet. Web is the semantic part of the internet. So it, web refers to the information you can access through the internet. And internet as a network would be rather there. I could have put the computer and connected, connected computers. Internet is connected computers. So <coughs> here you have the industrial technologic part, technological part of the revolution. And in green here, you have the cognitive and semantic uh, part of it. 
And of course, economy and society, or any sector in the economy, and I will give you some insights into uh, what I do now, uh, which is uh, um, looking at audiovisual uh, sector. Of course, the audiovisual sector, as it is, uh, as, it, as it refers to uh, the um, cultural part of the economy uh, and society, is completely uh, pressed into uh, between the, these two uh, thick arrows on my slide. Smart and cool. So smart is when uh, somebody, um, some designer, optimizes for you a service, an application, a device with an idea of what would meet your needs. So it's pushed towards you. You don't really control it. You didn't really ask for anything. It's proposed to you. And of course, then you select. If, if it's useless to you, it won't work. But uh, it, if it, in a way, is useless, you will adopt it. But you will not have full control of the parameters of the conditions of use. So it's a top-down approach. So when you hear about smart cities, about smart grids for energy, it's the general philosophy. Uh, the, the firm NG optimizes your <laughs> energy uh, network, your energy consumption uh, for you. Um, the uh, SNCF or the RATP uh, optimizes the transport network for, for you. Or <laughs> even uh, Apple designs this for, for you. Yeah. It, the top down doesn't mean that it's no good, but. Uh, you, you didn't imagine this by, by yourself. But uh, what, what is, uh, Apple is both smart and cool, because of course when designing new objects, Apple uh, takes into account the reactions of users, the testing, beta testing uh, procedure in designing the, the software of your, of your digital assistant. So cool, cool is not antinomic of smart. One may be both uh, smart and cool. You, <laughs> you all know people that, who are both. Uh, so cool is the idea that uh, there is a bottom-up dimension in the designing of the application service or, or, or device. And at least partly, the user has some hand on the way he can uh, use the tool. He can um, re change some parameters, control something in, in, in the process or in the algorithm. So this uh, balance between smart and cool uh, refers to the debate you maybe know about, which is called uh, soft computing. So some people think that uh, Big Brother is a real threat and all algorithms all uh, machines, digital machines and algorithms, artificial intelligence, should be completely transparent. Like the, the hood of a car, uh, you should be able to open the hood and to uh, look by yourself to any piece of the algorithm, to any piece of device, of, of digital device. Well, of course, this is, uh, it would be uh, um, maybe not very productive because you would spend a lot of time to <laughs> check that the system doesn't harm you. And the idea of soft computing is at least some functionalities of those digital uh, tools may stay in the shadow as they are not harmful. Everybody would agree that it's okay. Everybody agrees that if you press somewhere on this, uh, the light, <laughs> Uh, the screen uh, illuminates and you can do something. It's not necessary to tell you uh, the code uh, in this machine, uh, which uh, makes uh, when the battery is on, uh, how the, the screen is, light, is unlighted. But, of course, you would uh, like to have some information about uh, how the machine tracks your surfing on the Internet, um, because uh, 
on a, not, it's not really Apple, it's rather the mobile network doesn't treat, this refers to net neutrality, you, 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 you would like to know more how works network neutrality, how a mobile network treats differently uh, information as compared to, uh, to a fixed network, or things like that should be made more explicit maybe to users than it is today. So the idea is to sort out what should be completely explicited and which uh, is better not to completely explicit because it would be too heavy, too time consuming. Exactly when, when we have this uh, exchange or dialogue um, or conversation with a friend, you don't, you have some common shared uh, knowledge. And at each conversation, we are, you are not going to re-explicit all that you know the other knows. Okay. So if it, there is a common knowledge, a common feeling there are some, that some aspects of a digital world, you don't know exactly how they work, but they work properly and you are not uh, fearing that you are manipulated, then it's not necessary to explicit it more. And the, the last point is important. Uh, of course, the more you want to have control, the more you want that the tool be cool in order that you can see things, what you are doing or what it does for you, the more you have to, uh, to uh, consent an effort. So you are economists, you, you don't know, <laughs> on the one hand, on the other hand, to get cooler, you have to get also more implied. It's in, in common life, it's true also. If you are a cool person, you involve in a relationship, uh, it, it needs effort, energy, and uh, it has a cost. So, the idea of smart of and cool is also uh, linked to, uh, from the social point of view, linked to the uh, distinction between cooperative and collaborative. And uh, collaborative is uh, cooler and uh, uh, collaborative is cooler and cooperative is, uh, is, is smart. Um, cooperative is what happens in a good uh, firm, in a good organization, where uh, there are both, there are, uh, the task is well uh, defined, the organization is well defined, it's both uh, hierarchic but also uh, horizontal. Uh, people uh, in the group uh, mutually uh, respect each other, it's rather transparent, uh, the, um, <coughs> the firm has uh, values, uh, values, the agents in the firm have shared goals, uh, the network is organized but not too uh, uh, coercive. Um, the <coughs> there are short term uh, intermediary goals, um, there is a sharing of ideas, uh, um, <coughs> everybody uh, wants to uh, perform the, the goal and people are engaged in, in their work. That's the ideal cooperative, is the ideal configuration in a firm, in any organization. But collaborative is a, is a bit more or different. Then in a collaboration, the organization is uh, collaborative. You think of uh, Uber or uh, BNB or uh, um, targeted, uh, targeted social networks where, uh, where the goal is to exchange apartments, the goal is to uh, exchange uh, uh, transportation uh, facilities. So there the structure is looser, but there it works only if there is trust. So trust is a key word in the digital world, a key word in the digital world. Trust is not just respect. Respect is I don't insult you, uh, you we, <laughs> we can speak uh, uh, without uh, conflict. Trust is that I really trust you. Uh, we are part of the same collaborative world. Um, <coughs> there's a world I, I, I like, which is not a modern world at all, which was invented by uh, Teilhard de Chardin. Teilhard de Chardin is a French ecclesiastic uh, 
of the beginning of the last uh, century, uh, who wrote in the middle of the 20th century. And he, he was uh, both a priest and a geologist. And as a geologist, he invented, the, well, a geo imagine a geologist with a, a cosmogonic uh, view of the world. So his uh, theory or his view was uh, first was the geosphere, just uh, stones and rocks, uh, then the biosphere, life, animal, and man, and then the, in the future, in his future, uh, the noosphere. Nos in Greek, ancient Greek, is a uh, mind. Okay? So noosphere is, which was invented by um, Tigard de Chardin, was the last steps towards God after the noosphere, which is the sharing of intelligence, you, the man would become pure spirit and reach God. So you may think what you want about the, the religious uh, part of uh, that, but the noosphere was really a good idea. And I think that uh, Teilhard de Chardin would be very surprised if he saw, he imagined it as a film around the, the atmosphere. He would be very surprised that his fiber optics in the <laughs> in the ground, but his idea was exactly that, a world where people trust each other because they share the same digital uh, environment. Of course, he didn't think of digital, but he thought of uh, uh, mind communication. The system is more vulnerable because if some links are cut, or if, it, if trust fails, it falls down. Um, there's not only shared goals, shared short-term goals. There are shared vision. Some enthusiast people are enthusiastic. They believe in something. Okay. Uh, they are interdependent. If some fall down, the, the structure will uh, fall down. They share a tight culture. Uh, it's uh, again the idea of global of globality. It's not just sharing uh, procedures or ideas sharing culture with a long term. Nobody imagines that uh, the thing will, will fail. It's, we, are in, we are not only engaged, but uh, uh, we are uh, involved and empowered. It's bottom up. We are liable and responsible, and uh, we are the actors, uh, the players of our own lives and of our collaborative project. So, these ideas refer to what I call cool, say, in the uh, psycho-sociological uh, uh, register. Well, as I said, smart and cool uh, are not exclusive, exclusive from one another. Uh, they should be uh, reached. Um, <coughs> together. And um, one uh, of my fields of interest is uh, smart cities. So I often give conferences in, uh, uh, or speeches uh, inside uh, big uh, smart cities conferences. And of course, these conferences, which are sponsored by big firms in the energy or transport uh, world, think of a bottom-up, uh, top-down optimized system, but more and more they understand that uh, because there were failures in the uh, in, uh, Middle East or in the uh, Far East, some smart cities were built from scratch uh, without uh, any care of how, we, well, it was an ideal world, uh, flats, buildings where energy uh, saving uh, were designed uh, for welfare, but users and inhab inhabitants were not asked at all. So when people were introduced in those uh, mushrooms, uh, uh, smart uh, cities, designed in a top-down way, they were unhappy. Uh, it's, it's maybe smart that uh, light uh, automatically uh, is on when I enter uh, my bedroom. But uh, if I cannot uh, disconnect, <laughs> or if you, you all know uh, new uh, luxury hotels. 
where you don't know how to, <laughs> how to shut up the light. Okay? So this is very smart, but this is not cool at all if you have to uh, spend a quarter of an hour to, uh, uh, and end up by uh, taking off the, <laughs> the, the card which controls the, the whole system. So, <laughs> so this is the difference between smart and cool, and of course you can be both if you, uh, uh, if you are cool by design, if I may say so. What should be seeked for is a cool by design smart. Okay, so this refers to a, a list of uh, fields, net neutrality. Okay. In a nice digital world, uh, you, may, you must have some insurance that the networks and devices not filter um, content, don't filter information you want to, to access to. Um, you want um, not only the infrastructure, but the software to be neutral in a way, to be fair. You don't want uh, the algorithm on, uh, on Mythic, for instance. Or <laughs> uh, in, in all those, uh, Mythic is an example, but uh, uh, in my own field, the uh, SVOD um, sites, where you an algorithm an algorithm gives you prescription to which type of uh, movie would uh, fit you best. So you want this algorithm not to be completely biased and push to you uh, the last uh, blockbuster, despite of your interest, just for commercial interest. That the algorithm you don't want, that the algorithm serves private interest, you want it to serve your interest. We that, that means uh, fulfilling uh, as well as possible the quest you have when you use the tool. Security of networks, of course, uh, resilience of the system to, to bugs or viral uh, attacks. Um, all the privacy uh, debate, how your personal data and uh, personal image are protected by uh, in the digital world. Um, serendipity, one of the main... Uh, are, are there some people here who don't know what serendipity is? You don't? You do. Okay, you all do? Yeah. How to get where well, I don't know yet, I wish to get. <laughs> So one of, one of your main uh, pleasure, or one of my pleasure uh, in any case, when I'm surfing on the internet, is uh, the random walk. If I make uh, this morning, I had a random walk <laughs> in the Diderot <laughs> University, uh, because I, that's my first time at the, uh, in this room and, uh, and building, and it's... <laughs> It was not particularly pleasant because it took time. I feared to be late, which was uh, not <laughs> it's a joke, yes. <laughs> but in the internet, it doesn't take time at all. Uh, I can uh, switch from one side, I can zap from one side, one side to another uh, in a click. And uh, very often, uh, I go on the internet to buy, uh, say, uh, uh, a car, and on the site uh, I have a chat. We on the chat space. I meet somebody uh, who, who, and I because he has a car I uh, look for. I send him a message. Uh, ah, you like this type of car, and do you do you like also this type of novel? Oh. And I may discover an offer or a novelist that I didn't know, and then go and buy the book on, on, on Amazon. So this is Serendipity. Serendip is the story of uh, princes in the uh, antique uh, purse. Uh, and uh, those, uh, they are um, riding horses, and uh, happens to them uh, a lot of... Uh, 
troubles or both troubles and good uh, circumstances. And uh, at the end of this random and erratic uh, uh, way, way in the desert, uh, they finally uh, get to the palace and uh, they uh, marry the, <laughs> the princess. <laughs> there, are three, there are three princes to marry. And at the moment, everybody thinks that they will have the, the head cut because they are accused of uh, having a stolen uh, camel. But uh, they, find on, they find on their ways many indices that prove that they are innocent. And, uh, so that's exactly the, r the random part of the uh, internet, which is in itself a value and a richness of the, uh, of the tool. Of course, the, the, the concern that uh, online sociability wouldn't kill real life sociability. And on this point, sociologists agree that uh, the risk is not so much. People who have many online relationships, many followers on LinkedIn or Twitter, are also people who have many friends in ordinary social life. So this is not a major risk. Um, <coughs> The filtering bubbles here is a real risk. That uh, if net is not neutral, if uh, serendipity is not preserved, and if the system, if Google, uh, taking into account what we did before, what you did before on the net, uh, creates for you um, a closed, a closed and restricted internet, which is Nicholas uh, internet that I myself contributed to build up and which prevents me to go outside of that bubble, this is a, a real concern. <coughs> the concern that uh, fake news, say, internet should be a knowledge warehouse and not a, a garbage. Uh, social inclusion, everybody should have access to uh, uh, modern uh, networks and uh, devices. Uh, of course, with the pace, the continuing pace of technological progress, there is always some divide. There are geeks and there are uh, the mass of people. They don't have access exactly to the same tools and same services. But one should be uh, aware of this and uh, there should be some social uh, global regulation in order that uh, progressively the mass has access to the same quality of uh, service and networks as the geeks fringe. Addiction, so uh, I know that I'm over time, but addiction is this. So during three days, we, <laughs> we are supposed not to have any longer our security blanket. Um, if I um, don't take this uh, in the morning, uh, I forget about it. I come back, even if it takes a, a quarter of an hour. So there is this object as it's partly cool, so I can design it uh, my way. So I need it. And uh, there is also the, the, the addiction came also the fact from the fact that Everybody knows that I have this. So I internalize in my mind the fact that I should be, I, I, I may be connected by others at any moment. And if that I have not this with me, others will think I'm dead. And uh, I myself, the addiction is that if I don't go, for, for instance, this morning, I will not have consulted my, my mails. I will not have posted any tweets. Uh, and this, some others will ask, strange, uh, <laughs> Nicolas is out of the, <laughs> you see, you, you have the feeling that you must be in, in the bubble. And this can cause big, uh, big stress. And uh, one major cause of uh, burnout now in, uh, in some organizations is due to the fact that people are, in a way, completely overwhelmed, over, uh, overtaken by the, the flow, the tsunami of uh, information. So an important thing, uh, I have to conclude, I think, uh, soon.
we will still have an hour to come back to. Okay? But Yes, the coffee machine is important. It's not so much the connection. I don't believe you, for communication purpose, it's maybe not such a bad thing to have three days of the connection, but it's not the um, <coughs> permanent regime solution that you be disconnected. Because you cannot be disconnected because of the global uh, aspect of the technology, but what you should do is to give meaning, to restore meaning, to restore a story. Yeah. Why people get crazy? Because they have a flow of information with zero knowledge. They don't know how to interpret information. That's a flow of data, of uh, uh, rude um, data, not, in, not interpreted data. So you need interpretation, you need storytelling, you need interactivity, you need orality, you need the coffee machine. And you need learning. The one major problem in, and this uh, we discuss very much in the uh, Academy of Technology, how to make science and technology more acceptable to society. And one key uh, thing in this, uh, in this purpose is to uh, organize individual and collective learning of technologies. I better use this if I know people that use it properly. So my life, my digital lifestyle is conditioned by yours and should be disciplined by me and by people which, which live with me in the same digital environment. And another uh, last thing, important thing is that when you understood that I'm a believer in, a, in the possibility of a nice, cool digital life, but society as a whole is not in that mood. Society as a whole uh, would like, some would even like to go back to candle. <laughs> okay. uh, some uh, are so feared about the effect of uh, electromagnetic waves on health uh, that they uh, look for uh, desert <laughs> parts of the territory uh, out of any uh, signal. So to avoid this excessive uh, uh, reaction uh, and to allow um, the going on of innovation, the principle should not be at first a precaution principle. It should be first an odyssey principle an innovative uh, principle, but wise innovation, of course. Controlled innovation, to be aud audacious for long, you need to take some precaution or you will die. But what should come first is innovation to uh, dare to do things rather than to prevent any, uh, any uh, innovation with the uh, idea that it's necessarily a danger and a threat. And of course, in the digital world, this is very important. You should protect privacy and data, but you should also open your data and give your data to users in order to get innovative services. So there you have also a balance. Algorithms, artificial intelligence will provide you new innovative services. But the counterpart is that you will have to yield to the system some of your data in a liable and responsible way. And um, <coughs> maybe I could, uh, yes, maybe, maybe the last one. And if we collectively, collectively fail to get to, to this uh, cool uh, digital world, maybe you'll receive this mail. You see, Nicholas, you knew, and maybe light is uh, from now outfaced. It was nothing but a fake, a human looking avatar displayed in the real world for purely instrumental use. Uh, the true Nicholas is a merely virtual artifact. It is the very message 
you're reading presently. Please don't answer this machine-generated email system administrator. So if the singularity uh, catastrophe happens, if the transhumanist uh, philosophy wins against humanism, we live in such a world. So I'm the real Nicholas, and I'm human. <laughs> so I, I, I'd be ready to, to come back to, to the slide I skipped uh, afterwards. So me, Afroza, from option C, which is um, development part, and then Maya Munsur from option A, innovation part. So we'll both today is going to present this big data and its permanence and impermanence. So first, we'll give you the brief about what is this big data. So whenever we talk about big data, it's, it's a massive collection of data. And traditionally, the concept for this big data is associated with three V. So that is volume, velocity, and variety. So this volume is um, the amount of data that we are getting. So nowadays, it's like terabytes. But in the future, it might guess that according to IBM, it might go to in like uh, zero terabyte. And uh, according to IBM, that every day, we create 2.3 trillion gigabyte data. And by 2020, it can go like 40 zettabyte, which will be 43 trillion gigabyte of data. And then it's come to velocity. The velocity is the speed of the data, that how like, quick we're creating this data. It's like this real-time feedback, or the, uh, the, like, when we are streaming the things. This is how we are, we, we are creating this data. And then it's come to the variety of data, like what kind of data that we have, like different form of the data. We have data from Facebook. We have data from uh, different uh, search engines. Some data are structured. Some data are not structured. So we have this like, different kind of variety of data. But uh, nowadays, like, one of the things, like, it's really concerned, like, OK, we have the data, but what, to, what we should do with it, or how we use that. So then the concept come about the another V, which is the value that you that is mostly concerned with the data mining analysis, and then it's come like how to create the opportunity based on this data. So that is called the value. And here this come the algorithm, a different kind of algorithm they use uh, to take this data into information or knowledge. And then what is the source of this big data? As I mentioned, but here, this like internet platform, electronic devices, for example, the tab or phone. Like you are in here, if your phone's uh, net is on, so we can know your, uh, where you are, that your connection. And then maybe if you browse it, maybe you can see even in the online that, OK, this is going on uh, beside you. So you will get this kind of notification also. And there is also data regarding the financial data when you open the bank account or uh, an account and then you have, for example, even we get the data for your behavior and communication from one people to another, like how you're chatting also. For example, if you chat with a person for a long time and then if you play some kind of games in Facebook, you will see like that kind of person you're getting like, okay, what are the best five friends you have? You will see that person that you do sometimes chat or like have most communication, you will find like that kind of answer. So if we look at uh, like how like how much we are associated with this kind of platform, well, this is the the statistics that uh, from World Development uh, uh, Report, the d uh, digital uh, dividends from World Bank. So they are saying that in a one day, like 8.8 .8 billion people watch YouTube video, and then 186 million photos are in Instagram in a day. And uh, uh, it's like 207 billion emails sent in one day. So you can see like this is like a huge and vast amount of the data that it's really creating every day like, with our different uh, uh, activities through this online uh, uh, pl uh, platform. And when we convert this data into information, 
then we use like different kind of algorithm this is like the coded uh, 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 procedures and when we talk about this algorithm there are two type of algorithm mainly we talked about one is statistical algorithm and another one is semantic algorithm so statistical algorithm is basically based on your past communication or or your interest or or what kind of search you are doing in internet based on that it's create your own profile and the semantic algorithm you do it your own like you create your own profile sometimes you can also change that so basically when you convert this data into information we use these two types of algorithm to do it cool <laughs> yes um, and then one of the things I think in Facebook or in online sometimes we play different kind of games like it's pop up like in I saw sometimes like my friends uh, shared that oh my future job is this my future is like this so one of the things that I was playing like when I was preparing this presentation so what kind of what is your future job so it has a different question and then you answer this question like what is your favorite subject what is your favorite color what personalities you like like I really don't know like how based on this they create like they like generate this kind of information that okay I should be a business of man or a man like you are smart serious successful you will have a great life mostly on computer with much money and comfortable lifestyle so this kind of things you will see like based on like what kind of answer you're giving you find like different kind of uh, result like this So how we use this big data in every day? So one of the most common or very uh, uh, prominent one is in business and e-commerce. Like usually like companies, they are now changing even their business plan, like how especially based on this big data. And then if, and especially if you look at the advertisement and this, it's, it's like company, if you look at the mm, different uh, uh, digital, at uh, 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 revenue, it will say that Google and Facebook, it's taking like much of the advertisement uh, 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 revenue in 2016-17 and in 18 and 19 it will create more. And it's not just in the business case, nowadays in our social dynamics, politics in education and policy dialogue, we are having also this big data and, one, and me and some of my colleagues also uh, uh, presented how big data also in uh, relevant in uh, education for example MOOC or uh, like the, the classroom setting is also changing and it's also giving the advertisement for example I was looking at some program about PhD and then suddenly pop up these things in my page that the new PhD and postdoc faculty job posted every day take <laughs> step so this kind of things like based on your search they personalize your your account and they give uh, this kind of advertisement. And so now Mariam will talk most about the challenges and the regulatory system. Uh, thank you, Professor, for laying the foundation. Um, now we have an idea what big data is about. I will talk about uh, the challenges that this whole regime is, has introduced. Um, so um, the challenges that the big data uh, provides us is um, mainly circulating data security and privacy. Uh, the use of big data is not very easy and there is an understanding issue. We will be talking ab about the unreliability and uh, inaccuracy of uh, big data, its complex computation, uh, data management, and some ethical concerns. And we'll be moving on to the regulatory sites and we'll be talking about the regulation that's around the big data as well. All right, uh, regarding, regarding the privacy, if I say that we live in the age of big data, then um, saying this, that the privacy is one of our major concerns would be right. Um, this gray area um, has arised with the advent of big data in which uh, the users um, are creating their profiles and they are constructing a public image of themselves. Uh, through this big data and uh, through this they are posing a social um, uh, they're posing their social profile so that they can be understood through it so there is a need for publicizing um, this image 
and we are constantly, um, um, you know, um, surrounding ourselves with this situation. Uh, many web-based services such as Twitter, Facebook, um, LinkedIn, um, they are helping us to make this profile. And with this, private information is available for commercial use, and these websites are constantly giving the third parties this information with and mostly without the consent of the users. And in most cases, we have observed that these users are not even aware that their information is being given to the third parties, retailers, and many others who use this information to their advantage for commercial use. Um, a very interesting example uh, that, I saw, that I saw was um, uh, with this Amazon page when I was creating my profile over there. It said, um, I didn't even notice at first, but when I read um, carefully, I saw that it says that by creating an account, you will agree to all the terms and condition, our management policy of your personal information, and our policy regarding the internet advertising. And when I noticed carefully, yes, indeed, um, it, it gives me push notification regarding uh, advertisement based on the searches that I make, which is a little peculiar in my opinion. One other example um, of uh, this big data challenge is in the robotics industry. Um, we recently observed that Facebook, it shut down its artificial robot after it started creating its own language. So the, the robots that they created, they were talking in their own language, which was not English. Another example that uh, we saw recently was of the robot Sufi. Uh, who was granted um, Saudi nationality recently, and she not now wants to have babies. So there is no end to um, this uh, artificial intelligence and uh, robot engineering. And it is, this technology is rapidly um, you know, increasing at a tremendous rate. Which brings us to this question that there are um, you know, um, some ethical concerns um, regarding this whole dynamics. Uh, the first of all is that uh, it, the big data relies solely on human decisions, and sometimes it ignores human design and uh, inherent errors and biases in the data. It, it profiles individual, and uh, it may result in discrimination. Um, also, um, in most cases, it uh, lacks human consent uh, because, as I said, the, hum the users or the consumers are not even aware that uh, their data is being used for other purposes. Now, um, I will talk about the regulations surrounding this whole scenario. And the most interesting case is the Hedopi law, which was intri introduced in 2009 by the French president, Nicolas Sarkozy, uh, to ensure that internet subscribers screen their internet connection in order to prevent the exchange of copyright materials. However, it would be interesting to note that this uh, whole constitution, which was in fact, um, you know, um, uh, safeguarding the interest um, of the copyrighted materials was turned down by the Constitution in 2013, and it was replaced by a series of automatic fines. However, um, no uh, fines of only a thousand euros have been collected ever since the system was implemented, um, whereas the government spent millions of euros for the implementation of this entire um, Hedopi law. Um, and uh, creating this agency, so to say. Many other, um, many other regulations are also uh, surrounding, are also in, introduced in the EU zone, uh, the most prominent of which are uh, the GDPR, which stipulates that EU citizens have the right of protection of their personal data. Uh, and internet bills of uh, right was recently introduced in Italy, and also copyrights alert system in the US, uh, wi uh, which gives the users a right for the protection of their personal data, has been introduced in the US. Um, we would like to now wind up our presentation with a few questions for, uh, uh, for Nicholas. Uh, we would like to ask that, is there a need for global regulation for algorithms? Should regulation be globalized instead of being country-specific? 
what are the means to educate the end user who is generally oblivious um, of um, the corporate giants tactics for the use of personal information what is the future of artificial intelligence in your opinions is robotic technology likely to supersede labor in the new, near, near future through automation especially in the developing countries and does the growth of innovation at an exponential rate poses a threat to human control decision making and ethical standards thank you sir So you have 15 well, minutes to answer, or maybe or, take some time, and then or, maybe we'll okay. ask so students, other audience will ask some sure. more questions, maybe. So we can pose So the first, question. thanks to the two of you. It was, uh, I thought it was excellent. It was a, a complement and not a substitute of what I said. <laughs> and it's a good uh, um, <coughs> way of uh, launching a discussion. And your questions are just what I skipped in my slides, so <laughs> I'm ready to answer you. Uh, so maybe I could come back to my um, yes. presentation. Yeah. If you uh, may, uh, can get out of this. So, so your first question is about regulation of uh, algorithms. No, I, it may be both, as uh, in, in many economic sectors are regulated both at the uh, national level and uh, at least European uh, level. And uh, as concerns uh, not algorithms but privacy, um, pri <coughs> there is a uh, European economic uh, ruling, as you mentioned, uh, but there are also tight negotiations between uh, the European world and the uh, United States. Uh, the so-called, uh, which was at the moment called the safe harbor arrangements. Safe harbor is now out. Uh, it has a new name, uh, um, Data Shield or something like that. Um, of course, as uh, the Noosphere is a, is a worldwide um, digital environment, uh, one particular country cannot set rules, cannot enforce rules that would not be respected at all by, uh, by others. So you need at least uh, a soft global uh, regulation and an agreement on uh, general rules. Um, thank you. So specifically uh, about uh, algorithms, so you will I had slide to, to explain the difference between uh, uh, statistical and semantic, which is just the difference between uh, uh, smart statistical is uh, you look at your uh, past consumption and you infer a proposition and a profile from what the user consumed uh, before. So this is uh, not controlled by user. It's supposed it, it it's not necessarily biased, but the risk of a bias is uh, great. As opposed to semantic, semantic is just uh, like uh, the advice you could get before in a video store. You go in a video, you went to a video store, and uh, you told the uh, vendor that you would like some uh, kind of uh, romantic movie. You know. So the vendor in the shop knew completely the catalog, the base of content, and guided you to... Semantic is just the same. Semantic algorithm is a refined indexation of the content base from keywords or sophisticated keywords. And the profile enters by himself or, or herself her own profile, uh, which may change from uh, one evening to another. You may want a gore film or you may want... A, um, a nice uh, romantic comedy. So you, you enter your own profile and then the algorithm matches best uh, the, uh, the base with your profile. So you have control, this is uh, rather cool. So, uh, the, so this is one kind of algorithm you have on uh, video platforms, but the, you have uh, the same kind of uh, meeting platform like Meetik and everything, and more and more, uh, you will read to consume, 
to better consume as goods. You are economists, so you know that goods are more and more experienced goods. But you know the quality just after uh, you, you bought them. So you need priorly to have a lot of information to have advice from pioneer users. So those platforms, uh, those algorithms on these platforms is a way to make you benefit of uh, um, information about what could please you before you bought it. So you can buy it uh, in uh, more trust, uh, trustfully. So is a regulation uh, needed um, <coughs> for algorithms and more generally for intelligence artificial? Because algorithms as we know them today are just the first step towards uh, intelligence artificial. So what uh, should be noticed that uh, at this stage, uh, you have no uh, big brother. You have no uh, a wild, uh, uh, what is called a GAI, uh, not a global artificial intelligence, not a general problem solver. You have narrow artificial intelligence systems. Uh, each of them is well aimed to such or such a goal. Prescription algorithms, uh, programmation uh, algorithms, uh, operational research uh, algorithms, uh, language recognition or, uh, algorithms. All that are at this stage specific. Of course, you can group them in a, in a global system, but this global system is not today uh, reaching the kind of performance a human can, uh, can reach, of course. But on a specific uh, uh, task, uh, those algorithms they may be very, very, uh, very, very efficient, such as chess. Uh, the best chess player uh, is now a robot of Go player. Um, but uh, the same algorithm which is used to play chess cannot be used to give a conference at the Epoch seminar. But uh, soon you'll, you'll have a fake Nicola who <laughs> will be able to, to do everything, but it's not yet uh, the case. So the problem is that you have many algorithms in many fields that you cannot think of a national or worldwide agency which would control and regulate uh, that. Uh, uh, in a coercive and uh, prescriptive way, what you may think of is rather um, a regulation based on incentives, uh, a labelization process, a labeling process, uh, a scoring process. Uh, people uh, give marks to algorithms. Have, been, uh, have they been satisfied or not? Uh, which uh, which with, the with the algorithm, um, guide, maybe uh, general guidelines may be uh, edicted, but not in a coercive way, because you, you have to uh, preserve innovation. If you are too coercive, uh, if you uh, require complete openness, then uh, firms won't uh, go on developing uh, innovative uh, software. Uh, and maybe best practice is also well, yardstick regulation. Uh, look, the algorithm uh, or competition, uh, unfair algorithms uh, will be uh, rejected by users if on the market you may find uh, better algorithms that uh, don't fake you, that uh, um, you trust. So I think that uh, here again, uh, the, the key word is uh, trust. And to maintain trust, you must have some kind of light regulation. Uh, some uh, call it also nudge regulation. You know what a nudge is? You know. <laughs> OK, nudge. When your child is uh, naughty, you don't tell him, uh, please stop, or you will be uh, deprived of dessert. Uh, you just say, uh, you know what is the dessert uh, at lunch? <laughs> And if it's favorite dessert, it will auto self-discipline. So the idea is that uh, circulation, transparency, uh, is, 
it's a, it's a global system. So not only the algorithm must be fair, but uh, the system which gives you scores and information about the algorithm should be fair itself. It's a bit of a material as a matriarchal structure. If you don't trust the tool, if you don't trust the system which gives you uh, advices on the tool, if you feel that you are uh, completely uh, closed in and imprisoned in a in a bubble, then uh, you will be very unhappy in the but my, my personal feeling is that you cannot, uh, it, it would make no sense to have an agency of uh, algorithms or regulation as you have, a, an, agen as you have an RCEP uh, authority of uh, regulation of uh, networks or uh, authority of regulation of audiovisual. It would just have no meaning. And even in these uh, sectors like telecom or audiovisual, where you have a traditional standard uh, regulation authority, uh, it, those authorities, those agencies, become very unstable in the digital world. Bec and they have to be uh, less and less uh, prescriptive and coercitive and more and more uh, adaptive and uh, flexible and uh, more and more soft law than hard law. So, of course, uh, algorithms are, should be uh, in the scope of a new deal of regulation. Um, Another question uh, about pri uh, privacy or so. Uh, I, I will tell you a, a story. I'm, my wife is living in uh, haute savoie in the mountains, uh, southeast of France. And I go there every weekend. I work in Paris uh, during the week and go there every weekend. So I'm very often in the train on uh, Friday night and uh, Monday morning. And the three hours of train, I, I have many games to <laughs> to uh, spend my time. And one of these games uh, is, uh, I discovered it by, by, by chance. When you are in the train, many people, many of your neighbors use their computer um, and use their mobile phone uh, in a connection sharing device. Now less because uh, the SNCF gives Wi-Fi, but before people use their phone. So, when somebody uses his phone for sharing connection, then uh, the name of the phone is posted on your phone as it's considered as a Wi-Fi uh, spot. And sometimes people don't code their phone. Nicolas, Curien, iPhone. Uh, <laughs> Iris, uh, Blanket, uh, iPhone. So when, once I, you just Googleize Iris Blanket and you know everything about Iris Blanket. Uh, you know, and uh, you have a look on a, a computer. You know that she's preparing a presentation. You discover on LinkedIn that uh, she was just uh, appointed as the new manager of the bank, uh, the new bank antenna uh, in Annecy or, or Chambéry. You know very many things about uh, Iris Blanket. Uh, because of um, what she left herself on Facebook, uh, on Google, on Instagram, and uh, you have a uh, holiday uh, pictures. And, uh, and once at the end of the <laughs> travel, I uh, talked to Iris Blanquet uh, and uh, told you it was nice your, your holiday in Ibiza with uh, your friend uh, Eric. And she was. Uh, she felt so much uh, intruded <laughs> and aggressed that she was, she thought that I had get, got into her, mach her machine, that I have violated. Uh, uh, I said, no, I just have the information that anyone who knows your name can have on the net. So we are not even ourselves conscious of what we leave, of the data we leave. Uh, Concentrate. We, we, we have our own consent to do that. We, we know what we do when we put this data on Facebook, but we are not conscious at all that it is available to everybody who knows just your name. Your name today is, a, is, an, ent is an entry, is a free entry for any firm who, who wants to uh, exploit and use uh, your, your, your personal data. So. My feeling is that to regulate uh, privacy and personal data, every link in the chain should be involved. 
not only the firm, which collects and uses your data or yields it to others, but also yourself. So there must be, and that's one of the, your ideas, there should be, uh, and, uh, one thing I mentioned in my talk, um, the uh, how to learn to live in a digital world. And this starts by being by oneself conscient of, uh, of data, uh, um, of our data and how we control it and how we open it in the digital world. Uh, so it's, uh, it's more, uh, at one moment, the debate was uh, focused on who is the owner of the data. Uh, and uh, it was an economic view of, uh, of a, the issue in a way. Um, the owner of the data would have a right to tell what use should be done or not done with the data. <coughs> but to my sense, the main issue is not so much who owns the data uh, because it's a, it's a collaborative system where everybody owns a part of the data and everybody at least has liability, must have consciousness and liability about the use of the data which enters, you know, we are all black boxes and we uh, consume data and we produce data. So each link in, in, in this chain should be uh, conscious and uh, responsible and liable for what he does with data. Um, one other of your... Ah. What, uh, you had four questions. The other one is about artificial intelligence. Ah, yes, artificial intelligence. Yes, I have something about that too. I yes. So the, the, the so-called uh, singularity uh, catastrophe or the transhumanist uh, um <coughs> thesis um, claim that there will be a point, the singularity point, where artificial intelligence will dominate natural intelligence or natural dullness. Because to my sense, maybe uh, artificial intelligence will have succeeded when it will be able to simulate uh, natural dullness. <laughs> if you look at the Turing test, <laughs> one thing machine fail to do is to be as stupid as humans. <laughs> <laughs> They are not at least stupid the same way. You can, they, are not they, they are better on some types of tasks and they are much poorer on others. And they can make well, one thing why uh, we have not reached yet that point and maybe not ready to reach it um, is that uh, even not very clever people do not make uh, huge mistakes you know, in, in some cases. Machines can do. Machines, uh, ma they can uh, cause a, a crash because they 90 percent, 99 percent of the time uh, they will have learned enough not to, uh, to, get, to get wrong, but in one percent because the parameter is not exactly what, what they have learned even with new deep learning processes, they will think uh, it's a cat instead of a dog, they will think uh, it's the road instead of a wall, <laughs> and uh, there will be something uh, wrong. So we are not yet at this point, but uh, there are signs that we could get to it. Uh, not just because of um, so-called uh, Moore law, where any machine, any software doubles its uh, performance, uh, in a two years' uh, time at cost and cost, but um, also because the capacity, uh, the computing and uh, storing uh, capacity uh, is um, <coughs> increasing uh, very rapidly, so that machines are dull, but they can do very quickly uh, many things uh, together. So it's possible, it's not impossible, 
that uh, we have uh, robots that uh, some kind of global artificial intelligence should be uh, ready, say, in uh, five to ten years. And that the, it, could be, it could occur that intellig artificial intelligence would be better in many cases than uh, natural intelligence. But that doesn't mean that man would not have control on this uh, super intelligence. That's, that's one of the main issues about the cool. Okay? Your, your boss may be more clever than you. Uh, many people may be smarter than you. And may, you can live with them. And you maybe can have some control on how they will impact your own life. It's not because we will have very performant robots that we, they will be completely out of control. It's a, that's the ethical, uh, ethical uh, question that uh, you, you raised. So at this time, we, we, have a, we can guess that this point will arrive, but that doesn't mean that man is an imperfect robot and that it uh, should aim at... This is the transhumanist uh, view. Transhumanists say, uh, well, we'll all become robots at some stage uh, because uh, medicine, uh, well, the, the ITs will go under the skin and uh, your uh, three-dimensional printing uh, will replace your heart, your, <laughs> your liver, your <laughs> and uh, you will live uh, maybe uh, 1,000 years instead of uh, 100. And... Uh, <coughs> And the transhumanists claim that uh, it is an uh, inelectable uh, future that uh, the human dimension of man disappears and with the idea that machine is, a, is the ultimate uh, goal. But uh, a more realistic view, to my sense, but it's very difficult to, to convince people that uh, think that transhuman transhumanism is the is the future. Uh, my view is rather that uh, we should think of uh, hybri hybridization between uh, men and robots. Of course, we we'll live uh, a longer time because uh, we, we, we will be uh, able to repair ourselves in a way. Uh, this will, in a way, uh, create new types of inequalities people who have money to live uh, 200 years and some will have not. So the world will change. This kind of things will happen. Some... Uh, yeah. You see, today age is something like that. Uh, there is a, a mean age of a population and all people die before 100. And, uh, <laughs> It's not a Pareto distribution. It is not a long tail distribution. Probably in uh, in hundred years from now, some the even age will be distributed with a with a long tail, which will considerably change the, the way of life. But this doesn't mean that man will have disappeared. This doesn't mean that ethics and uh, humanity and values will have completely. Uh, dis uh, disappear. This means that we have to care about these uh, ethical uh, questions and uh, to care now. Uh, the singularity catastrophe is if that we don't care uh, will be uh, like a Prometheus with uh, fire with, uh, or Pandora will open a box and if we have no we don't uh, have any control on that box then anything can, uh, can occur. But if we um, have a, a kind of homeostatic process in which society continuously adapts to technological controls, technological process and adapts to it together. I took the example of a burnout because of nomophobia. Nomophobia is a, nomos is a low and phobia is a afraid of. Nomos is not low, <laughs> it's no mobile phone, <laughs> no mobile phone phobia. Well, okay, so 
today's nomophobia that tomorrow it will be uh, intelligence artificial uh, artificial intelligence uh, phobia we shouldn't be it's always the same uh, um, the same song in a way you shouldn't be afraid that the world change we should make it change and control it and uh, I like this uh, No, it's before. Yeah, this one, you know this uh, the Purple Rose of Cairo? So at the moment, uh, one of the uh, characters in the movie gets off the, the screen and falls in love with a real person, a real person uh, played by Maya Farrow. So this is a singularity uh, catastrophe. This <laughs> The, the movie director completely loses control of the movie and some of his characters become real people. And uh, the movie is really uh, interesting there. <laughs> and it happens in several <laughs> theaters. <laughs> so you have several clones of the same character in, uh, spread in real life. So this is completely um, unpredictable, of course. So may but from the, from the point of view of the character, he takes his school, the guy, because he takes his, <laughs> his, um, his life in, uh, into his hands. And then uh, another, yes. The future more looks like this than just extrapolation of this. So we <laughs> the idea is that uh, we don't, people who fear technology, people mm. who fear the future, generally consider that they are taken in a move they cannot change. They are, they are taken in a determinism that uh, everything, they, they believe in fact that, uh, they believe in the law of physics that everything is determined by the laws of moves and the initial, uh, initial conditions and they, that they have no way to change anything to, uh, to a trajectory. And, uh, to, it's maybe partly true, but it's also true that uh, if you are audacious, if uh, you are innovative, you can draw a line. You don't know it is impossible, so you do it. If you think that something may be impossible, you, it's finished. You wait for, for the end. If you want to have some impact, on, uh, on, on yourself and on the world, you must think that uh, impossible things are not impossible. You don't know it's impossible, you do it. It's a Mark Twain's uh, a quotation. They didn't know it was impossible, so they did it. And uh, uh, there was another question, I think. Your fourth question. Regarding growth of innovation, the growth. Uh, how should humans should control over this uh, innovation? This one. Sorry. Ah uh, yes, it's um, <coughs> yes. This one. Uh, it was uh, my graphic. The future of, of artificial intelligence is still open. What? Uh, it's not a continuous uh, uh, progress. Uh, from in the um, since five years, there is a, a big acceleration essentially due to uh, the recognition of, um, of speech uh, and recognition of images. The next semantic big step in the internet world is the indexation of sounds and images. Today, you, to a search on Google is based on a text. You enter keywords. It works well. But uh, if you enter a photographs, uh, it's not yet available. You have some advanced um, engine uh, uh, <coughs> and search engines that do that, but it's not uh, yet commonly spread. But tomorrow, Google will be able, you, you enter a photograph, uh, a picture of Nicolas Curien at the age of eight, and it will <laughs> send you all the pictures of Nicolas Curien at all ages 
uh, which are available somewhere in the, in, in the database. Or uh, you will take a picture uh, of you, for instance, and I will know everything about your Facebook, uh, Facebook uh, and internet uh, life. <laughs> and uh, of course, this will uh, uh, considerably uh, uh, diversify the, the kind of information you, you, you can get. And uh, it will also considerably uh, ease the interface with machines. Because if this table uh, recognizes my voice, it will be able to, <laughs> to shift uh, when I will uh, knock it or things like that. So you, we, Internet of Things is a good uh, calling because in Internet of Things, things will be less things. They will be less things because they will communicate with uh, beings, with thinking beings. So the smart road, smart table, smart fridge, is the, which was a, a way of imagining the future, is now close to us. Okay. And um, it's, uh, yes, your question was... Uh, Maybe we can ask the audience if they have questions. Right. Yes, we, we, we will uh, go to audience for that. Yes. Yeah. And of yeah. course, there are there. you are economists, and uh, one of the main questions is uh, um, the labor question. Uh, I called off, uh, I talked about hybridization, hybridization in the economy between men and, uh, and robots. Okay. And today it's not also ineluctable that uh, robots will kill work and will kill employment. Mm -hmm. It will, of course, displace employment as it has displaced value. Value, labor are not generated at the same place. They are not uh, performed the same way. And uh, they are not, the value is not created and it's not collected at the same place. So there are big economic and social shifts. But sh once again, uh, I'm irritated when I hear people in the uh, telecom sector or in the audiovisual sector, they say that digital innovations destroy value. This is completely stupid. Of course, all this creates value, but these are not the same who uh, create it and who collect it. So the problem, it raises a huge issue. The cake is bigger, but the rules to share the cake have to change drastically. And the risk is that initially, of course, well, we discussed it during the, the interclass, um, the risk is that the new digital uh, players, the so-called GAFAs, as they create this new kind of uh, value, will keep it entirely for themselves. Okay, and today, in the audiovisual sector, for instance, you have many discussions between uh, uh, TV channels, for instance, uh, <laughs> and uh, platforms, internet platforms. Many of the audiovisual consumption today is on Facebook, is on, uh, is on Google. It's not so much on the Hertzian uh, platform and on your uh, traditional TV set. Many people, may, and young people, look, uh, watch uh, movies on Netflix, on the internet, on their tablets and, uh, and, and smartphones, and not on the... Uh, living room uh, screen. Um, so the value, <laughs> the service is augmented to users, but the value is not collected by the same. And the traditional actors, the standard actors, are not condemned to die, but they are condemned to make the, due, the, the good deals with the new creators of value in order to get a part of this value. Uh, at the time where the um, the train replaced the uh, carriage transport system. If I was a manager of uh, a firm of uh, carriage uh, transport, I had better time to invest in railways rather than in uh, putting bombs on rails. And many uh, traditional uh, um, players who fear 
digital revolution, uh, they only think of taxing Google, uh, protecting, uh, erecting a firewall around Europe in order that Netflix cannot penetrate. It's just like uh, um, raising a small wall to avoid a tsunami. Okay? Makes no sense. So, but it, it needs some uh, courage and some uh, vision to accept the change. There is a Chinese proverb who, who, who says, uh, I have somewhere, it's somewhere yeah. you saw it? Yeah, this one. When the wind of change blows, some raise walls and others uh, build windmills. Building windmills is going with the change accepting it. So the Keynes sentence is uh, very inspiring too. The difficulty is not so much to understand new ideas, to get rid of old ones because you benefited of the old order of things. So you would like that it wouldn't happen, that it changes, but it changes. But instead of uh, being completely uh, shocked and knocked and uh, swept away by the change. You should get adaptive, uh, flexible, uh, soft enough, cool enough in order to get your own profit from the general mood. Move. Uh, this image of a coyote is good too. Uh, many of uh, the hexagonal, the French classical uh, TV channels, for instance, they are like this, uh, this guy. They <laughs> their feet uh, are no longer on. on the, there's a nice sand area here with the sea, but uh, you should go by the right path here, adaptive, uh, learning softly. And this guy thinks he's still there, and soon, he will crash. He could have done other way if he had anticipated. Yeah. Okay. So thank you, Professor, for the answer. So, so now we can open the floor for the audience. So can you take like two or three questions together and you answer? Or? Uh, yes. I uh, yes. I how time? How much time have we? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yes, but I have a driver who waits for okay. me, so uh, say 10 to 15 minutes. Yeah, okay, so what question? So, Emmanuel. Thank you very much, Professor. My name is um, Akonde Emmanuel from Option A. I wanted to uh, dispute that really, really big data has been affecting our humanity and ethics. And I want to ask. How should the mainstream and the heterodox uh, react to this? I, I will cite two uh, examples. The first one is China using uh, big data to yeah. predict the, the uh, propensity of individuals to commit crime. And yeah. the uh, mathematical uh, distribution they use to program these softwares are not based on the psychological uh, human behavior models, like the uh, Lewin's uh, human uh, behavior uh, model. and Another form of model that depicts human beings as uh, homo sapiens and uh, homo economicus. Yeah. The second um, illustration is uh, I, was the, I was on a platform on the, all this uh, Sophia stuff, mm. and uh, I was suggesting that Sophia should be connected to the internet. Like if you ask Sophia, Sophia, can you cook Chinese dish? Yeah. She will cook it because she will connect to YouTube she immediately, like one second. And uh, sh it should be connected to porn site and, and every that thing. So yeah. as a guy, uh, as a rational guy, why would I marry a girl if I can marry Sophia? She can cook me any dish, can do anything. So new things will evolve, new uh, customer, uh, consumer behavior will be evolved, consumer perception. So, and, and hence, this is why I'm disputing the fact that big data has been has been derailing the uh, humanity and, and ethics, and how should the mainstream and uh, heterodox economics react to this? 
Yeah. Hi, I'm Luisa from Option A Innovation. Um, thank you for your presentation. Um, last week, uh, we had a seminar given by Françoise Benamou, and she was talking about platform power yes. and how big data has been accumulated in the hands of giant companies. Yeah. And uh, at the end, uh, the discussions propose um, something that has been already studied and, and proposed by a PhD student of Paris 13, yeah. uh, the idea of commonizing big data. And the idea uh, of what? Of uh, transforming big data into a commons. Yeah. And uh, today you talked about big data. Uh, you said it's like a already a collaborative collaborative system mm. uh, because we all consume and produce data. Uh, so we already have the characteristic of shared resource. Yeah. Uh, so I would like to ask you, um, um, how could big data be transformed into a uh, commons? Uh, like how can we uh, build a governance system and um, also the bundle of rights uh, and also, um, given the obstacles of, of, of uh, private interests, mm. is it possible to implement this idea? What is your yeah. point of view about My this? Is, uh, so I start with your question, and maybe I come back to, you, to your point. Um, my feeling is that you should preserve uh, a space for innovation where data is completely shared and uh, open. You, you cannot. Uh, you can dream of it, but uh, it's not realistic to have uh, a completely collaborative world where everybody sh would share all data because uh, it's not consistent with uh, uh, with uh, business and uh, necessity to. If uh, if information, uh, you have a stage of data, raw data, raw data, much of it could be shared, but of course data uh, a bit transformed by an actor with added value, then it has added value. And uh, the one who added the value uh, has some kind of uh, right of property on, the, um, on this value addition and can, uh, of course, uh, base his business plan on, uh, on this uh, value addition. So it's not realistic to, uh, that everything would be uh, open and could freely uh, circulate. But it is necessary but at least for research purpose or for uh, innovation uh, uh, purpose, um, some kind of uh, raw data may, might be uh, made available um, to uh, innovative, uh, to academics for research and to innovative actors wi which will invent new uh, new kinds of, uh, of tools uh, that would be able to experiment new kind, new kind of uh, deep learning uh, intelligence and so on. Um, so all data should not be completely, if you uh, extrapolate uh, completely the rulings of the uh, CNIL in France and, uh, and the RS, uh, RSPG in Europe, uh, if you want that everything, uh, it's all, it's the, soft uh, soft computing uh, you you have to instillate uh, some uh, softness some uh, coolness in, uh, some flexibility some openness in data but it cannot be uh, you cannot you cannot imagine that all data in the noosphere in the internet uh, would be completely a common good even if today but Today it's still the case that uh, I guess 90% of, uh, of data is available for free on, on the net. Yeah. And one of the riches of uh, the net is its uh, common good uh, aspect. Uh, for instance, uh, it happened to me that uh, I, um, there, there was no battery in my uh, car key, so I couldn't open uh, automatically the car two in the morning uh, under the snow uh, in the mountain. Fortunately, I had battery on my uh, smartphone and uh, I immediately found a post posted 10 years before by somebody who had the same problem and who 
knew how to mechanically open the door with two short clicks in, a, in one sense and three long clicks in the other, and I could open the door. So this kind of free uh, long tail information is a precious good on the net that should be completely uh, preserved. Um, and I guess it, uh, it will, even if you have a, a podium part on the net, in, in a Pareto distribution, you have a podium and you have a long tail, a podium where uh, you can pay to access for, for the information. So this, this is one aspect of the thing, but the other aspect is uh, the one you mentioned, is that new uh, artificial intelligence will develop only, it, it consumes a, a lot of data. Uh, it eats a lot of data. To learn a machine how to recognize a dog rather than a cat, you must uh, introduce in the neural network uh, a billion of pictures. So if you have to pay rights on this billion of pictures, this, this won't work. So, so you must have some kind, some degree of uh, freedom. So I, I would be uh, in favor that uh, in the uh, low settings and in the European uh, rule setting, there is a specific uh, disposition which preserves this freedom for academic and for innovation uh, purpose. I think that's the right answer. Um, so your question is that, uh, yes, uh, you saw the movie uh, Minority Report, with the, uh, where the algorithm guesses uh, crimes before they, uh, they occur. Um, so what is exactly your, your, your point? Is that, uh, My point is that how to... How to how did the mainstream and the heterodox economics approach uh, this? Because um, it's really also affecting uh, our ethics and uh, ah yes, rationality. Yes, and humanities. The question of rationality. Yes. Okay. Yes, but um, I think that uh, you know about uh, economics of intentions. So I think that algorithm, algorithms and uh, artificial intelligence uh, is a way to uh, give a new importance to the economic of intentions. Um, you are not always a rational guy. You, when you come back from uh, work at night and you, you want to watch, uh, to, to liberate your mind some way and uh, and watch something that will bring you some uh, some pleasure, some um, some way of uh, not thinking of what you think about. You you are not very rational. You have the vague intention to uh, be pleased by some content that would be uh, proposed to you. Today, the algorithms, even the semantic algorithms, if you go on a SVOD uh, platform, doesn't fulfill that uh, that function because you have to introduce your profile. You have to know that tonight you want a uh, romantic uh, comedy, but you don't even know if you want a romantic comedy. You, maybe what will do the machine tomorrow and what it doesn't do today is to analyze the context. Uh, the machine will uh, notice that uh, you come back at nine instead of eight, so you had a long day. Uh, that maybe you are not in the mood of uh, knowing exactly what you want to consume. And maybe the, all this contextual data that the machine will be more and more able to uh, collect with a webcam, with uh, recognizing the sound of your voice, which may be not exactly the same uh, every night, it will uh, take into account that kind of data to guess your intention. An intention that is not even, that's like in the minority report, some criminals are not even conscious yet that they will commit a crime, but the machine, analyzing the context, is able, uh, the precox, <laughs> is able to, um, 
to guess in a way, to, to interpret. It's just a machine, but it will uh, interpret what you are not uh, even conscious you have in mind. Uh, so I think that um, when I started my uh, career as an economist at uh, France Telecom, um, the club, the, the theory of clubs, for instance, was a part of uh, theoretical economics, which was uh, rather exotic. It had no uh, real application in the uh, current, in the analysis of uh, current markets. But with the development of markets, uh, of networks, at that time, uh, the first of the networks which was the telephone network, the club effect became a central issue in the industrial organization of the networks. Why? Because uh, it, uh, it was a uh, a powerful engine to, uh, to stimulate uh, demand as uh, the supply uh, uh, for uh, avalanche effect, the growth of the supply stimulates the growth of the demand. That's the so-called club effect. The more people benefit the service, the more newcomers want to benefit it also. So some some economic laws, which were in the shadow, became very important in the economic analysis because uh, the real world was obeying these, uh, these laws. And I think that economics of intentions has a good future. If I was in a Master two and uh, I was thinking about my dissertation, I think that uh, economics of intention is a good uh, match, matches well the digital world. Because the, the new uh, internet uh, revolution, uh, the new stage of the revolution, will be uh, when the robots and machines and uh, tools will be able to guess your intentions and to analyze your intentions. Not only, you see, uh, statistical algorithms uh, today, they explore what you did in the past to prescribe you things that you should like in the future. But more and more, they will do more than that. They, they will uh, explore your environment, explore your, your contextual data. Context uh, will more and more drive content, I think. And uh, intentions uh, are derived from context, from interaction between uh, your traditional rationality and the context you are, uh, you are living in. Do you have time to take some Oh, yes. Or last question, maybe. Uh, do you have any more questions? Maybe last one? OK, so you, I would be happy to, to interact further. You have my, uh, mm -hmm. uh, uh, it's the last one? No. I don't know where. Ah, it's uh, blocked. You have my. Uh, uh, this one is your. Ah, sorry, sorry, <laughs> sorry, 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 of course. <laughs> I like this one. It's a. Uh, I use for uh, talks about uh, uh, the digital future of the visual sector. This is the ball, the pre digital ball in the uh, digital ocean. So the big fishes are the GAFAs. The small fishes uh, in the audiovisual are TF1, uh, M6. Uh, so they are the hexagonal, uh, traditional, national uh, actors which pre-existed to digital. And they don't really realize that the, vocal, uh, that the ball is open. And in 10 years from now, there will be no longer ball. Some of the small fishes will have been eaten by the big ones. Some will have uh, climbed on the back of the big ones. Uh, some of the big ones will have uh, burst out. And, uh, well. The ecosystem will be global. But today we are still in this transition world where some people imagine that they are still in a bowl and that they will be able to protect the bowl. And uh, yes, I, what I wanted to show you is uh, just that. I have a um, personal uh, website where there are serious things and less serious things. I, 
you will see. And I invite you there. And of course, my mail address, you're free to, to write me anytime you want. And I will be happy to, to interact. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for the presentation.